let's review a few mathematical concepts um, and, and perhaps try to relate them a little bit to some fluid things. So uh, gradient, gradient is an operator that acts on a scalar, reduces a vector. So the gradient of say some scalar like pressure, for example, and I'll write this in Cartesian coordinates, is the partial of pressure respect to x in the x direction plus the partial with respect to y in the y direction plus the partial with respect to z in the z direction. Physically, what this means is, um, let's say I drew contours of constant pressure. So this was say, um, you know, you've seen a topology map and these would be lines of constant elevation as I was drawing a mountain. And when they're closer together, that means things are changing more quickly. Um, and, you know, let's just make these into curves. Let's say they look like this, whatever they look like. The gradient at a given point always points in the direction of fastest increase. So of all the directions I could go, there's one direction where, in this case, pressure is increasing the fastest, and that's the direction the gradient points. So if this was a mountain, this would be the direction I could go that would have the steepest slope. Um, divergence. Uh, operates on a vector and it produces a scalar. And in this case, the divergence of V, well, again, I'll write this in Cartesian coordinates, this is the partial of the X component with respect to X plus the partial of the Y component with respect to Y plus the partial of the Z component with respect to Z. Um, if I take the divergence of the velocity field, that actually measures how fast the density is changing, the rate of change of the density in, in the space. Or in other words, you could say it's the volume change per unit mass. Um, and so actually a, a good definition, and we'll, we'll see this later, but uh, if the divergence, I'm erasing this, you can see, if the divergence, the velocity is zero, then the fluid is incompressible. Right? It's idealization, but that's a good mathematical definition. That means the density doesn't change uh, or the volume change, or the volume doesn't change per given mass. Okay, so it can't be uh, compressed or expanded. Right? If I if I have some control volume around a given mass, it could move around and deform, but the actual volume won't change. It's not compressible. It's incompressible. Okay, and another quantity is the curl, and this is an, operates on a vector, but produces a vector instead of a scalar like the previous one. Um, and here's in Cartesian coordinates, so I'm just going to write one of the terms. So this is the partial of the Z component with respect to Y minus the partial of the Y component with respect to Z. And that's the X component of the vector plus the partial of the X component with respect to Z minus the Z component with respect to X and the Y component plus there's a Z component. Right, and you can get this from a determinant. Uh, you can review that uh, if you don't recall these things. But um, if I'm taking the curl velocity, uh, or, or in general, this measures how much or uh, a vector field uh, is rotating, basically. And so the curl of the velocity field, this quantity here, omega, this is called the vorticity. This is a quantity we'll use quite a bit, um, and it is related to the angular velocity. Right? We talked about this related to rotation. In fact, it's twice the angular velocity, but typically we just use the vorticity. Okay, um, there's a couple of theorems that we'll make use of uh, that relate some of these quantities. So uh, one is imagine I have uh, this curl of some vector field and I integrate it you know, how much that, this person is a vector, right? And integrate how much of that is leaving some given area. So this is a double integral across some area. This is equal to an integral around a contour, right? So in other words, imagine I have some cross-sectional area. This contour C is the perimeter, whereas A is this area. So if I was to measure all the 
rotation, right? That's basically what this is measuring is kind of my, my uh, angular rotation, angular velocities. If I integrated that all the way across the area, it'd be equivalent to integrating this quantity just around the perimeter. So in other words, I can figure out this quantity that's all over the place just by looking at what's on the boundary. Um, one way to think about it conceptually is that all the rotations are gonna cancel out on the inside, ex except for on the boundary, because there's nothing else to cancel on that side. So all that matters is on the boundary. But that may or may not help you, but just one way to think of it. Uh, another integral that we, instead of relating the curl, we're gonna use this divergence here. If we integrate the divergence across a volume, so we take this, uh, actually I have not been using a vector sign for that, so let me be consistent. We integrate the divergence of a velocity over its entire volume. So now I've got, I don't know how to draw this as a volume, but say this is this big three dimensional volume here. Actually, let me draw the inside, just like I did before. So the inside here is this volume. And I want to integrate across this entire volume, the divergence everywhere. It is equal to this uh, flux across the boundary area. So in other words, instead of integrating across the entire volume, I can just integrate around the surface area, right? That's the exterior here. So kind of an analogous type of thing. So I just go around the outside boundary. So again, remember this kind of measures if this was velocity, how much something wants to compress or expand. So if this was expanding, then that means there's be something is gonna be coming out of my control volume and I could measure it by seeing how much comes out of the boundary, okay? So these are both useful quantities because they're gonna be able to tell us things about the interior of a domain without having to integrate across this huge region just by looking at these boundary conditions or sorry, uh, properties at a boundary. All right, let's talk a little bit about index notation. Um, this is also called Einstein notation or tensor notation. And we'll just talk about a few things today. Uh, and this will be the last thing for today. Um, one, and, and we use this a lot in some of the fluids equations, but let me just give you some examples. So let's say I have this equation here. This is just a, a simple PDE. It's part of the Navier-Stokes equation. Just simplify it a little bit here, okay? I'm gonna write it like this. So here where I have I, and it appears in every term, we're gonna say this is a free index. Okay, it's a free index, uh, meaning it's not coupled to everywhere else, right? And it should appear everywhere. And that means that I have, it represents three equations for I equals one, two, and three. In other words, it's a vector equation, right? We could have written this in terms of vectors, we could have written um, u with a vector and x with a vector, uh, but it'll actually be more convenient to do. Stay with me for a second here. I'll explain that in a minute. But so, so what this would be explicitly is this would be three equations, and I'll use one, two, and three uh, for a Cartesian coordinate. So you could think of that as your x, y, and z direction. But I'll choose one, two, and three. So this will be u one plus with respect to x1 is zero, and then row u2 plus x2, and then running out of room here, u3, x3 is zero. So in other words, this thing is shorthand for three equations, but again, not that different from what you might've thought from doing just a vector, okay? So let me erase this here. This is called a, a free index. And that is different from another type, um, which I can write like this. I'm just gonna write one term like this. And because these both appear in the same term, this is a repeated index, okay? It's a repeated index because, and it, and it has nothing to do with whether it's i, it could be i, j, k, whatever. Um, but because these indices appear on different terms, right? There's pluses or minus separating them, the different sort of groupings of terms. It's a free index. If they're on the same term, it's a repeated index. 
And what this means is it's a summation, okay? So you could actually write the summation symbol, but what this means is I've got u1, x1, u2, x2, u3, x3, okay? Which by the way, this is the divergence of the velocity field, right? Remember this one. So one way to write it is this way, an index notation. Okay, so it's just another compact way to write these and we can combine these things. So here's an example. You might pause and try it on your own, but I'm gonna do it right here. So again, it's good for you to try, but here we go. So let's identify what we've got here. Notice that um, I is a free index. And if I've got a free index, it's gotta appear on every term because this is a vector equation. So it's gotta be everywhere. Um, last one is just a scalar. And here's a repeated index, it's on the same term, so that's a summation, so I've got both types here. So I've got three equations, and in each equation I've got this summation that I've got to expand. And so this is gonna look kind of ugly, so I'm actually just gonna show you. This is what it looks like. Again, if I use my colors, notice free index, right? That's this one. Um, so in the first equation, everything is a one. And the second equation, everything is a two. And everything here is a three. Whereas this repeated index means a summation for just that term, right? The summation is restricted to that term. So I don't sum the whole thing. This thing doesn't sum. That thing just stays there. But I sum this part three times, right? For the three components, X, Y, and Z. So I've got one, one, two, two, three, three. One, two, two, three, three, right? So in other words, this short thing represents these three equations expanded out. And I know it takes a little bit of getting used to, but once you do, it'll make your life so much easier because we can represent these complicated equations. Because these, by the way, these are terms that appear in the Navier-Stokes equations. And really, I should have put parentheses around these just to be clear. But these are, these are the momentum part of the, um, obvious Stokes equations, part of it, the left-hand side, the momentum side. Um, and you might ask again, why not just use a vector notation? Uh, we certainly can do that and we could use summation symbols and that's not too bad. Uh, the real challenge comes around when we want to introduce tensors, which we will have for too long, like the stress tensor. So, you know, we have scalars, right? Like density. That's a scalar. Uh, velocity is a vector, just has one component or it has a one index, right? But something like shear stress, that's a tensor, has two components. Um, and actually, we can have higher order tensors. So sometimes, especially with uh, mapping between tensors, you know, we may have third order, fourth order tensors, or so on. And you just can't do that with vectors. Uh, I mean, it's really hard to do that with anything besides index notation. That makes a lot of things sim simpler, doing some cross products and certain things become much easier in tensor notation, especially related to a lot of the fluid equations like the Navier-Stokes equations. So again, once we get to these tensor cases, um, which we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, I will introduce one now I'll save this tensor for later. Okay, we'll talk about another tensor another time, but I think that's good for today. Uh, so next time we'll get back to doing fluids, we're gonna talk about um, dynamic similarity.